My name is Ethan Alpern, and thank you for joining us this evening. Throughout this semester, we as Educational Leadership and Policy Studies students have evaluated and discussed how the concepts and practices of education have evolved at the same pace as globalization, diversity, technology, and research. It is time to move beyond the simplicities of 20th century education. We need more than just the syllabus, the textbook, and the question. 21st century educational practices need to integrate the new world within each lesson. I'd like to invite my classmates to help discuss the following topics in order to better examine the issues at hand. First topic, would it be beneficial to develop and offer a curriculum that focuses on globalization? I think it's absolutely important for globalization um, in 21st century education. What we should be taught to possess as future academic leaders is global competency, which is defined by Fernando Reimers. Global competency is the knowledge and skills people need to understand today's flat world and to integrate across <coughs> disciplines so that they can comprehend global events and create possibilities to address them. Um, he's a professor over at Harvard, so I think he's pretty substantial there. But I think it's something we all need to possess. The world we live in is getting smaller and smaller. We have a good cross-section of the world in this class alone. So it's something that we're coming in contact with every day. Um, and how are we going to understand each other, or the people we work with, or the people that we're going to be leading as future administrators if we don't have global competence? I definitely agree with that, and because this world is getting so small, and because we have this globalization happening, um, I believe that students and professors, teachers, need to build partnerships so that they can develop together the tools that are going to be necessary for learning and for teaching in 21st century. We don't have those clarified yet. So we need to develop them together. But one of the things that will help, and an example of it is Dr. Lawrence Andre's class, um, bringing the perspectives from different cultures into learning, that will be an important tool. Because um, globalization is taking place in business, in our economy, and uh, we as educators need to prepare the future students, or the current students even, to be able to go on to those, that um, type of a world and be able to function with the differences that cultures bring. So it's going to be important to bring that perspective into the classroom, the globalization perspective. Allow students to share from their different backgrounds on particular um, issues that are being discussed in the classrooms and share how they view that so that we all learn. And I believe that the teachers also will be enriched by that expression in the classroom. You know, there's many definitions of global education, but in 2002, the Maastricht Global Education Declaration, which was uh, put into effect, Global education is education that opens people's eyes and minds to the realities of the globalized world and awakens them to bring about a world of greater justice, equity, and human rights for all. And it's understood to encompass development education, human rights education, education for sustainability, education for peace and conflict prevention, and intercultural education being the global dimension for, of education for citizenship. And that was the uh, Maastricht Global Education Declaration. We talk about uh, globalization and the need for that within our curriculum. Um, I'm curious as to what everyone else thinks is, is the appropriate time to introduce this curriculum, what this curriculum would look like. And also considering um, Dr. Kenneth uh, Clark and his wife Mamie Clark and their doll test, which showed that by preschool, kids already have developed um, a sense of to them, what is beautiful? What is darker versus lighter skin tones and all that's beautiful and globalization considering those things. When do we put when do we put this curriculum in and what does it look like? According to Dr. Martin Conroy from the International Institute of Info Information Planning, um, the curriculum is going to have to involve um, different communication styles, taking into consideration the cultural differences. 
definitely part of it is going to be the new technology, and I know that will be a topic that will be discussed more fully later, uh, is also going to take into consideration um, the different business styles, and um, that will be part of, the, of that curriculum, the linguistics, um, and so forth. And also, I just wanted to say that um, since uh, President Bush classified that uh, uh, Iran is actually an axis of evil, and the Western news um, continually talking uh, about how Iran is evil, that's why Iranian most of the Iranian uh, students are actually silenced in the classrooms. And as uh, like every other students, we actually Iranians also have voice as well. And Professors has to actually need to lead the knowledge, um, and to a lot, uh, you know, a knowledgeable discussion, and that's why we should actually have a culturally and linguistically um, diverse education, which will help the students to um, develop the uh, knowledge, um, actually knowledge, understanding, attitudes, and um, skills that is necessary to participate, um, necessary to participate. Uh, responsibility in a um, changing world and also preparing the students um, to function um, in a uh, global uh, economy in the uh, 21st century. Well, I was just going to piggyback on that by saying that in a lot of the reading and the research that I have actually done, it seems that in order to prepare secondary school students to actually transition into higher education, it's proven to show a lot more uh, success in countries that are more specific with their secondary education and such as like the uh, math and sciences, whereas um, US secondary schools and elementary schools tend to be a little bit more general in the education that they provide. So students tend to do a little bit better if they're more honed in on specific topics to transition into higher education. Whereas even though I know that you know, the US, they offer a little bit more variance in programs, if we could kind of collaborate on that or figure out what they're doing right in these different countries to hone in on our secondary school students to kind of prepare them for higher education, I think that would be very beneficial in terms of organization. We have um, four courses for our education. Uh, just to piggyback on that, one of the things we could do is incorporate some of the um, cultural classes as part of the core and have that become, right now, I know that high schools have language, a second language as a requirement if you want to continue into higher education. We could have uh, cultural classes that teach someone about a specific culture, talking about specific training that is available in other countries. That would be something that could be incorporated here. It's making that a core class for education. It's a very good point. Uh, and of course with globalization that leads us to the topic of cultural diversity. So I propose, what can be done to develop a program with an emphasis on diversity? Um, well I think with diversity there's a lot of different aspects that you need to take into account, not just the different cultures, but the fact that in the United States if you're trying to create a positive learning environment and education, you need to actually have people not just tolerate other races, and not just appreciate, but you need to have them actually fully understand. And it goes both ways. So you've got minorities, it doesn't matter what ethnicity they're immigrating to this country, they have to learn about a quote unquote American culture. So why not have people that are raised in this country with the American culture learn about other cultures as well? So I think that we need to figure out a way to um, kind of bridge the gap between the two. And instead of just saying that one group needs to learn about the other, I think we need to figure out a way to kind of find the middle point for both um, so that there's no resentment, there's no animosity between anyone. Uh, and I think that'll help with diversity as well. Um, <clears throat> Just to go with that, thinking for the students that have been assimilated to this culture like myself, um, it becomes a little bit difficult with uh, in a class of the culture. Um, Sometimes we talk about the Latino culture, and I'm Latino. However, I can assimilate to the United States. So it makes it a little bit uncomfortable for me. Um, just because I don't know so much, so I tend to stay quiet in the background. Um, just because, like I said, like, I really don't know. And when anyone talks about other cultures, 
I have this tendency that like I want to be politically correct. So I'll just stay back and just listen because I try not to offend anyone. So to get those students to get talking to learn I mean, it may be difficult, but maybe there's certain way to get them going. I think in a lot of regards, political correctness can silence curiosity when it comes to learning about other cultures. And so part of the educator's responsibility is to create a safe environment for people to be able to share and learn about diversity and globalization without fear of offending anybody. And as educators, we should be aware of that. And I think that, that I, I agree with you. And uh, as uh, teachers, I mean, we, when, when teachers are able to, I think they need to uh, incorporate the um, the other cultures that that are like in this room, where you have Persian, Saudi Arabian, Chinese, um, all sorts of different cultures, Indian, Sikh, Latino, Belize, all different cultures, and. That way that students can avoid offending out of ignorance, uh, which is one of the, I, I think is one of the largest problems is, is a lot of folks just haven't had the, uh, one, especially in, at a young age, K-12, when they're coming into school, uh, they haven't had the, 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 the issue of, of coming into contact with other cultures or with uh, perhaps they have had bad experiences at home, which may not be conducive to open talk or to uh, to being able to communicate with other cultures uh, and other other folks, people that uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, all that sort of thing. Uh, they need to be come in contact with it and uh, not be ignorant. Cultural competence. The Institute of Study of, of Social Change called it in 1990. Uh, I come from China. I am the international student, so uh, there is more and more international students came to study abroad in America. But I think the problem is not just because of the culture shock. Do you really think uh, American university are quite prepared for the huge number of international students? I mean, based on the schedule of the, the source, the class, for example, the mathematic class, a lot of Chinese students always talk about the, the mathematics class in um, American university. That's so easy. That's that's the easiest <coughs> class. Is why it's not not because our uh, we are smarter <coughs> than uh, other students. Just because we have learned than before. So maybe something you you guys need to change for us. Yeah, that's uh, great. Interesting that you mentioned that because um, I think it was last. A few weeks ago, there was an article in the New York Times about that, about international students, specifically from China, actually. Um, and it's kind of a, a conundrum that they were talking about that it's both a good thing and a bad thing. And um, of course, the, the good thing is that you know, there's more diversity, we learn more from other cultures. But the thing is, like, it's, the schools do it because um, it really helps with the budget gaps. But, um, but I think the people who really suffer the most are really the students because they don't have the system set up for them. So they're really <clears throat> make it difficult because there's a toll pole that they have to get prepared for and then everything else that they have to do to, to come here and then the, the school system, the classes aren't really set up that way. You know, so a lot of conversations, a lot of things that you're supposed to kind of adapt to. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, there's a, there's a two, what do they call it? There's really two sides, yeah, double edged sword. Right? Would anybody like to touch on how the role of the affirmative action plays um, in an educational institution in the role in the matter of diversity? Yeah, it's interesting um, when you bring about the discussions of affirmative action because affirmative action means two different things depending on what camp you're in. You know, there's some that ascribe to the idea that affirmative action is basically, oh, you're brown, you're black, you get to come in. And that's an interesting case in point when you think about, well, what is it? Legally, we know by the Michigan Supreme Court cases, Gratz and Gretter, 
But you can't do that. It's illegal to award extra points in admissions just because you happen to be of a certain skin color. And then, therefore, making it easy for you to come in. Affirmative action makes it so that you have to meet all the requirements that are necessary. Um, we know um, from Sandra Day O'Connor's opinion that it's great you can consider diversity, um, your background, as one part of the application. Um, and then it's even more striking when you look at it at home because when you're from California, you hear about that. I think people who are students during the 90s probably are much more um, in tune with it, but I do think that um, it's real interesting because in California, the propositions have changed so much for us. California Proposition 187, Prop 209, there was something called SB1, which was supposed to take into effect long before these whole cases came about. And SB1 was where the UC Regents had moved to discredit race as a consideration in admissions. And we don't really talk about that, and it kind of became null because even though the trustees passed it, California law came into effect a year before, so it kind of made that null and void. But then also think about the history of this. Affirmative action has been in place for years and years. Um, there was times when Jews weren't allowed to harbor. Affirmative action came in to say, hey, you have to stop uh, considering race, you've got to stop considering religiousness, and let people come in. And it happens also with the GIs. You know, there's a lot of sentiment, resentment against letting GIs in, but what happened? We created the GI Bill, and that was the affirmative action to get GIs back into colleges. And I think also another point to consider within all of this affirmative action, when we talk about what's going on currently with uh, um, helping out um, blacks, Latinos, um, we're helping out um, Native Americans as well, and, and all that whole discussion, affirmative action is only going to affect such a small percentage. Affirmative action will maybe affect maybe about 1% of the applying college uh, applicants. Um, those who maybe on the, are on the borderlines of, well, I'm not sure if they should be admitted or not, they meet all the qualifications, but maybe yes or no. Um, so I just kind of want to pose those things and I want to know what other people know, because I know this is such a hotly contested um, issue. Well, the uh, statistics sound like that it's uh, almost a moot point, considering today's uh, problems with getting into college anyway, if you don't have any money, uh, or if the, if the economics continue the way they are, how in the heck are you going to get in college even when, you, uh, when you're afflicted with that? You know? it's something to think about. Well, I know we also at CSUN have programs like the EOP program that helps, you know, certain students of, you know, different classes or financial statuses, you know, have a chance and opportunity at an education. So there's other types, I guess they're affirmative action-esque ways of helping students out from like lower incomes to enter into the university. I think that also kind of touches back to what I was saying about secondary schools and preparation. There's also the issue of access. Some secondary schools are so underprivileged that they don't have the same resources that others do. So it's not really a level playing field no matter how you look at it. Because certain you know, uh, low SES schools, they're not going to have the same resources and availability to things that higher SES schools are going to have you know, availability to. So that's a huge issue and it has to be equitable. <clears throat> I agree because uh, the high school I work at North, um, there's a magnet called the High Gift, Highly Gifted Magnet, and then there's a regular school. The Highly Gifted Magnet gets all the AP classes that want. Um, however, the kids that I work with, they don't get a magnet, they have to fight to get it um, for language, arts, and arts major requirements to get into college. The only class they have available is Spanish. While the HDM kids have like Spanish, Italian, French, and all that. So, in order to pay off the link, uh, you know, just uh, about the playing field with this be better to you know, help them out. I mean, if you're talking about diversity, that is like the perfect example of how diversity really isn't working, I feel like, because, I mean, diversity is on not just a skin color, it's everything. You're, we're all diverse in our own ways, whether it be financially, ethnicity, beliefs, whatever it is. But if you're in a school, in a secondary, you know, in a high school, and your friend is in the magnet program and they get to take whatever class they want to take, but you didn't 
for whatever reason qualify for the magnet program, that's not equitable right there. So if you're going to talk about diversity, then we need to start there and figure out something, some sort of way to level the playing field, like you were saying. Because um, otherwise, forget getting them into college. They're not even going to have the same opportunities in high school. And that's a public high school, right? So if it's a public high school, then why is it? I would say that as Saudis, we are more local to get admission uh, in university because we have scholarship from our from the government. But once we go to the university, we face many difficulties that we don't think that we will have. What sort of difficulties? Like to get classes. Uh, it's not easy to get some classes, and once we we know we want to know about the, each class what's about what, that will help us to know what's what's the program about what we can do what we can add and go. Well. Yes, to be an international student, it's hard to get the the correct and the useful information. We don't know how to get and we don't know where to ask. <coughs> Well, that seems like it could possibly be a technological difficulty at times as we progress. So I would now like to ask, how should the institution create a program that promotes digital teaching and training? I think currently when we look at today's youth, it's easy to assume that um, everybody is a digital learner. They've all grown up with technology and our educators have had to catch up in that field. And most technology is related to entertainment. And how do we harness this technology that's designed for entertainment and bring it to education in a way that connects to the youth and that will further bolster education and include globalization and diversity. And being creative in those solutions is where it begins. I've got to say, I think a game changer that I saw last night um, was uh, a piece called, well, uh, it's a gentleman <coughs> named Khan who was, who was doing YouTube videos to teach his niece algebra and mathematics. And he would put them up on YouTube and all he would do was, would, would be solve a problem, speak with his voice, create the video, his niece would look at it, and then other people started looking at it. And he said, hey, this is great, why don't you do more? So he did more for free. And now he's got a thing called Khan Academy, which for free offers 3,000 videos covering everything from ar arithmetic to physics, finance, history, and practice exercises. And they just received $15 million worth of uh, 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 startup money from the Gates Foundation, Bill Gates. And Bill Gates has uh, gotten behind him on this. And it's a not-for-profit, uh, um, and they are testing it in uh, K through 12 schools right now. A small number, just to see how they go and to see how it's going to work. To me, when when I saw this, I said, "This thing is big. This is huge." So basically, what they do is they switch homework and schoolwork. Schoolwork is what you schoolwork becomes homework. So so when you go home, you log on to Khan Academy, 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 Khan Academy, and you look at your lesson, you master your lesson, you go to school, if you have trouble, the teacher comes and, and, and works with you directly. If you don't have trouble, you're, you're able to go on and continue your lessons. I think it's a beautiful thing, and, and who knows where it's going to end up, but it's, it's, uh, it's amazing, and it's free. And so everyone has access to it? I have access to it. I've got it right now. Oh. Is, it, is it still on YouTube or is it its own website? It's its own website. Oh, it's called KhanAcademy.org. Um, I believe like with education becoming more uh, or less accessible in terms of economics, you know, tuition is going up, book prices are going up. You know, technology is definitely the way to start servicing these uh, sectors that otherwise wouldn't have access to education. And so something like YouTube is, is a perfect example because it's also something that's utilize, that you could view in a mobile device. There is universities that are utilizing mobile devices 
to get you know information to students. You know, there is a university down in South Africa where the professor gives permission to students to utilize their mobile devices to take pictures, to record lectures, and to share the lectures with students who may, might not have access to commute to the university. So I think having not only the access to computers, but specifically more to mobile devices. And so we need to start making uh, material available such as reading documents that you could maybe pull up on your mobile device that you probably wouldn't be able to pull up on a computer. YouTube videos you could pull up on a mobile device. And I think more and more, even low income students have access to mobile devices. You see that, and they might not have the access to a computer, you know, that you know we might take for granted. So I think educators need to tap into the resources that students are utilizing for everyday uh, use and just translate that to the classroom and utilize that and, and find a way to uh, make that connection. And I think our universities not only need to see what the students are using, but take what they're using and implement it in the classroom as curriculum. Yeah, because there are faculty in the U.S., um, specifically because we are talking about this region right now, um, there's faculty like Nick Berbulis who are saying, you know, when you can carry the internet in your pocket, there's something about rethinking how we teach our structured classrooms. Um, when education becomes an anytime, anywhere enterprise, that's when we need to reconsider also lifelong learners, folks of all different ages who are now saying, hey, I have an opportunity and I want to take advantage of it and I want to learn. So those are all things that we need to think about when utilizing both technology and also the techniques that we were taught as educators and future educators. I will say that, um, I'm sorry, uh, one of my personal experiences when I was teaching in New York um, a few years ago, when the e-books, e-readers first came out, um, I found a website that was, it's a donorschoose.org, um, and I was able to get like one class set of e-readers for my students. And it was, everybody was like, well, how are you gonna keep track of them? What if they destroy them? What if they do this, that, and the other? And it was very interesting because the statistics for my students, as far as their reading, these are high school, low-income family students. When they got the e-readers, they actually read the books. Um, if I handed them a story of, you know, whatever, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the actual book, they wouldn't touch it. But then when I gave them the e-reader and they were able to actually download it and read it on the e-reader, they were so excited and they were actually taking, because you can take notes on those, they were taking notes on them. I would come in every day and check their e-readers and there was like highlights all over the place. And I was like, what is happening? But their reading scores, reading comprehension, they all went up at least 10% for each student, which I know is not a lot, but it just goes to show that you know technology really is the way to go now, so it excites people. Yeah. I think a big problem um, with technology um, now, well, on university campuses, is the fact that not a lot of professors, or a lot of older professors, like, don't know how to use the technology. And this is where we're in class, and we <laughs> use, like, 30 minutes, because the professor doesn't know how to connect the laptop, or how to bring up a certain program that the student made the video on. And so I think that's something else that needs to be changed. I think maybe the universities need to um, have a better approach at maybe, um, I don't know, retraining every summer or something in regards to technology or sending out links or helpful, like quick facts to professors. Um, because a lot of times it's, you know, the students are advancing with the technology and I mean, Next year's probably incoming freshman class will probably know more about technology than I do now. So, I mean, and if the professor just stays back from when they started teaching, it's not going to be helpful to the students. And I know I have a lot of, well, as an undergrad, I had a lot of syllabuses that said, uh, or syllabi that said, oh, no computers, no phones, no this, no that, but then we're watching, you know, like we have a PowerPoint in class the whole time, and, you know, we could be following the PowerPoint on our computer as well, or making adjustments to it on our own computers as well. So that's something else I think 
that needs to be changed. And so the lifelong learning becomes a, a real important issue. Just to piggyback on that, um, the older faculty generations need to be updated and learn the, the new technology so they can make the best use of it in class and allow the students to use it in class. But it's becoming a necessity to have the technology knowledge because I have two children who are in middle school and if I want to view their grades, I have to go to Jupyter Grades on the computer. And I have to learn how to use that system in order to see how they're doing in class. I have access to each of their classes and each of their tests in those classes and projects and everything. But I can only do that if I log on to Jupyter Grades. They will, they will not send that at home. They still send the usual report card you know, at the end of each term. But if I want to see a daily uh, performance, I have to go to Jupyter Grades. So it's a necessity that we all in this new world, 21st century learning, are going to have to be knowledgeable about. And that's where long term or long life learning is going to become an issue. Especially when I think about the limitation of resources, a lot of universities and places of work are saying, we've got to go with cheaper paper. We've got to use less paper, less copies, double-size your copies, don't print out any emails unless it's absolutely necessary. And in high schools and junior highs, middle school, kids, and twelve, especially, where resources are already very limited and where you know the, the grades can't maybe be sent home as often or things like that. Having the having the use of the internet is so crucial for that. Also, when we used to think about invitations, make a paper invitation, invite someone, we now do it through evite and other things on the computer. So it's a necessi necessity. And especially, I think another thing to consider is when we're in the classroom, some of us who have that natural curiosity to know a little bit more, or, or who's that professor citing, or has this professor considered something else? I mean, like, I'm always on the internet when the professor's talking, because I'm looking for other things. I'm looking for materials to back up what I'm going to say. Um, I think especially when when sometimes you are fed a line that don't contribute to the conversation unless you got something smart to say, and and especially when people are telling you you got to analyze, you got to analyze. That's the biggest thing in college. You got to analyze the situation. Well, how do you best analyze when you go search the facts? And sometimes you need the laptop in front of you to be like, oh, I remember it was something like this, and you Google that something, that little piece of information you got, and bam, the whole court case comes before you, or whatever else information you need. So when we're talking about like affordability, I think that universities or campuses look at a cost, because now you have to buy software, you have to give your student you know, the, the technology to be able to look this up. But I think I would like to see like our university take more advantage of free items out there such as like Google apps. You have Google, uh, uh, what is it, docs, you have calendars, and something that our university did tap into was actually giving Google, or what is it, Gmail accounts to students. And that freed up a big chunk of what they were spending in IT to manage the emails they transferred that over to a Gmail account, which is free, and now all of our students have access to that. I would like to see some of our professors also taking that free software, free uh, networking that's already available, and students utilize being applied into our education so that we as students are utilizing it, and so when we go out into the communities, and perhaps if we're gonna be teachers ourselves, you know, we start introducing our students with that knowledge, or maybe they'll introduce us because they're they're a lot more, I guess, uh, they're born into. They're called what is the term now that is being like they're native to technology, whereas we're foreign. So you know, that's something I would like to be see at our university that they start utilizing more of what someone not reinventing the wheel, basically. Mm -hmm and it's utilizing a lot of that free technology that is available to us, so it would be cost efficient. I think also to go off of that, um, something I have yet to see with the you know, Google accounts here at CSUN is the whole Google sharing docs, the calendars, like all of that stuff. I haven't had any professors like share a document with the whole class through, through the Gmail account, and you know, these are all things that are pretty easy to use and 
it will get across to everybody in the class and you'll constantly have access to that because Google Autom or Gmail con like already saves the documents to your email and it's backed up through the docs um, um, tab on Gmail. So I think those are, you know, small things instead of, you know, having to go through Moodle and getting the document that way or, you know, just making things like easier and through the use of technology. So I think that's also something interesting. And um, to go on to um, some other things, I, I know um, I had said that some professors aren't utilizing technology as they should, but then there's professors that are overusing technology and making everything online. And you know, it's where, you know, sometimes to the point where you have a seminar class, but then they're sending everything through the internet and then they start canceling classes and just saying, oh, you know, how about we just have discussion on Moodle for this day's mm -hmm. class because so-and-so I have a lunch date or whatnot. You know, so it's like you, you're supposed to be in seminar, but then you're getting everything through email or through a forum online. So I think that's something else that needs to be evaluated as well. We, we can all agree that technology is evolving and that changes the way we do things. And it can be argued that traditional research methods over time have become obsolete. So I've, I ask you again, in what ways can an institution cultivate and improve students' research techniques? Um, in coming years, there will be a significant shift from place, a place-based education to online education. A recent report predicts that by uh, 2019, 50% of the courses high school students take will be online. It will be possible to provide the uh, quality of education by using of new media and communication technologies, technologies effectively. But it, it is still uh, also a necess necessity for students to learn to read critically and write well but it is no longer uh, sufficient. They must also cultivate, cultivate literacy in, their, uh, in the technology they will use in their personal and professional lives. Lives, yes. Um, the professors, the faculties should use the contact from diverse groups and web teaching concepts and the skills and help students to understand how knowledge knowledge in the various disciplines is con constructed and help students to develop positive intergroup attitudes and the behaviors and modify their teaching strategies so that students from different racial, cultural, and the social class groups will experience equal educational opportunities. So um, the total environment and the culture of the school must also be transformed so that students from diverse ethnic and cultural groups will experience equal status in the culture and life of the school. And in addition, um, it will be impossible um, to provide the quality of the education students need without a professor guided use of new media and the communications technologies. Um, while some faculty are skilled and are beginning to realize that the potential of these technologies um, most resist innovation and insist on teaching as they always have done. Um, like, I, I think the faculties should um, provide uh, um, more new media to the students, like um, um, for, for them to um, um, make it more convenient to access to the resources. So um, it's maybe um, possible for us to get on the library to get to the database at home, but instead of to go to the school and find the faculties, find the sources. Uh, that's more uh, kind of waste time waste. Technology will only improve the availability of sources and resources when it comes to research. Um, one of the other classes I'm in, the entire class is working on a similar research paper and um, we all needed access to David Weber's research and the, cop the library only has two copies. So out of a class of 30, only two students who got their first were able to access the information.
information needed. If research becomes more available online, such as databases, then the entire classroom now has access to that research. It also means that publication of research can be faster and more instantaneous. You're not waiting for the publishers to actually print the books and for school libraries to be able to afford that $45 book for students to access. You can now have it online where the costs are minimal. I was just going to say, being at CSUN, we're very fortunate to have the search engines that we do. We're so, so lucky to have those. But, you know, when I'm doing like my Google Scholarly searches and stuff, and just store comes up, or other articles that maybe I couldn't find through the CSUN uh, search engine, I think it speaks volumes that you still have to have the access to, to gain that information. You have to pay for a subscription. You have to, you know, you have to pay into it. So that should be free. It should be available to everybody. It's, it's promoting research, not inhibiting it. I also think that we have to be very cautious with um, the internet because not all research is uh, valid research. And so I think the more that we expose students to the internet and the type of research is out there, also teaching them how to differentiate valid research from someone just out there on Wikipedia, for instance, being able to write a, 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 a document on pretty much anything and, and have a student in a secondary school say, oh, well, that's the truth. So I think with the technology that's happening, the more that we also expose our students, we also have to teach uh, in terms of how to, um, you know, how to select the research that they find. Would you guys say that students' dependability on the um, evolution of technology today for research is a positive or a negative? Positive. Positive. So you think it's okay that if we have a, uh, an assignment uh, with a question, we can just type it into Google and get the answer? Or, or do you think there's a chance that that could be a little too lazy these days? Well, I well, I think if you if you do end up typing the question to Google, you should have you know the critical thinking skills to kind of weed through those mm -hmm. articles that you find to find the you know the articles and the the research that you find to you know find the answer that you think is the most legitimate, the most you know research based, and not just be like oh I found this on you know, Wikipedia and sure that seems like the best answer. So we should have the skills to use this technology to you know, sort through what we know is right and what we know is just some work that somebody put together and put on a Google. And even with technology being out there, it's not to say that it's the is all end all. I mean, you always want to supplement what you find online with what you can find in the, mm -hmm. in the library. Um, I think it also goes back to educators, 21st century educators. It's our job, if you're going to be a teacher, then it's our job to teach the students how to do their research. And if you are going to type something into Google and you know look for the millions of documents that come up, then you know which ones are a reliable source. So it's not like you know, you're just throwing them out there and saying, use technology, go Google, whatever you want to Google. Um, you, I think as educators, we need to like help them figure that out and develop those critical thinking skills, so. Yeah, exactly. So if you know how to differentiate between a certified, you know, actual scholarly research and just some article online, then you know how to do it. You know? And I think that, you know, that's why the internet kind of gets, a, or actually any kind of technology kind of gets a bad rep because it's not printed in a book, all of a sudden it's not really you know, legitimate. But even Wikipedia, you know, you can read a Wikipedia article, and you can look at the sources and you can see where the sources are coming from. It doesn't mean that Wikipedia itself is bad, it's just really your own ability to differentiate. It's, it's and it's not just independent research, but coming into the classroom and then discussing that research and formulating ideas and getting different opinions, which is extremely important. And as educators, we should be facilitating discussions. I think then it's much easier for the international students as well to, it's not about how to, it's not about to be lazy because if you actually read it as a textbook or other books, it's very hard for the international students to, you know, use the dictionary as an old, uh, you know, dictionary, but it's much easier to actually um, translate the article or the book uh, on the, you know, Google or internet so that they could understand what they're reading. Really 